So, as, yeah, like, like I said, I'm going to give you the story. And if you want to consult more academic resources, everything will be on the slides, which will be shared after um, the session. So I just have five minutes and then Rob or uh, sorry, Clive will go first. So for 10 minutes each. Right, so let me give you the background a little bit. And obviously I'm using the song We Are the Champions because it really reflects the story behind the, the, the champions community. And to me, especially Freddie Mercury embodies that greatness. That is the, to me, like the, the personality of, of the community, of the champions community. So the story behind it is that I was selected by Microsoft back in 2019 to, to, ro to roll out the, the use of Microsoft Teams for teaching and learning. Um, so in order to persuade staff of the benefits of using a new tool um, in their teaching, I <clears throat> created what is called, I call the champions model. And this champions model is made up by three principles, is community of practice, virtual community of practice, peer coaching and champions roles. And today we have three of the champions. The original gang is six of them across faculties. So first element, I'll go just go really quickly. The work of Wenger Trainer heavily influenced um, this with, uh, with his theories of social learning. Um, I had the opportunity to have a chat with them, with the couple, Beverly and Etienne Wenger Trainer, and they gave me some great insights into what you need to build a community of practice. So first element is fi find something you're passionate about, you care about, find something people care about, and find your allies. So I will go back to this um, a little bit later. So that, that's the first principle. Second principle was peer coaching. Often we want to persuade staff in my role as in digital education is to train and persuade staff about uh, using technology in their teaching. And Peer coaching is great because it's very tailored to the pedagogical practices of, of a, a given context. And this is when the champions, their work comes in because it is the peer influence, it's that collegiality and the, and the culture of sharing and the pedagogical knowledge and the challenges and the benefits. That's where the benefit of using this model was, this was going to have an impact. Right, so it sounds wonderful, but it wasn't that, that easy. It was full of challenges and trials and tribulations. Uh, we went through a period of three or four months training the champions. This was September 2019. Um, I, we had a series of events. We had a series of training uh, sessions with Microsoft, with Dominic Williamson, the then program manager. So anyway, a lot of work. And then in January 2020, this is where the community of practice open up to, to, to the whole university, to the staff. You can imagine what happened. It didn't work. So I had, remember the three elements is find something you care about, find something people care, care about and find your allies. So I had two of the elements and I had so much trouble persuading people. I would try to engage them in the community. I would do all sorts of things. I would knock I would, on their doors. I would invite myself. It, it wasn't working out. People will leave great feedback about the webinars and the trainings I had across the university, but they wouldn't engage in the community. And then, of course, COVID happened. And in March 2020, this is when, where the community exploded and it grew exponentially. So all the work we've been doing for months finally, finally paid off. So, And the rest is history. We have... We have had three rounds of the Champions program, 328 members at the moment in the Champions community, three institutional communities of practice inspired by the Champions community, one national community, virtual community of practice, four international virtual communities of practice based on the Champions model, and one learning and teaching fellowship. So I would say it is a success. It has been a success. And to be honest, I don't know where this is heading, but I think uh, that according to the theory of communities of practice, there are stages and we are at the moment in a mat maturing stage and it will probably fade out at some point. You know, it is all about value and the value it brings to the university. So I'm going to share some resources at the end. I just want to say that perhaps a virtual community of practice is not the solution for all problems it, when it comes to Digi using digital technology in academic staff, but it's a great strategy to persuade them uh, um, 
perhaps you can create more problems by using this virtual community of practices strategy. But I think its selling point is that is collegiality. And if you have a, a, mo a, a model of champions, colleagues that are committed, then is more likely to work out. And I'm going to share some resources if you're interested to find out more uh, about the theoretical underpinnings and go deeper into this topic. I will share a couple of links in the chat in a minute. Okay. Thank you. So no Q&A now, uh, Clive, is your turn. Thank you so much. Okay, so can you hear me? Am I okay? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, and you can see the screen, yeah? Yep. Okay, so um, th this is a demonstration of my approach to flipped teaching, digital tool training and evaluation. Uh, the context is MA in teaching English to speakers of other languages and applied linguistics. This is the module digital technologies in language teaching. Group size this year was 16, but a similar approach has been done with 50 students last year, for example. So um, basically, this is the framework. My approach to this module has three elements. First of all, the topic. Uh, so um, there are 10 topics, uh, 10 weeks uh, across the entire module, and I'm picking on certain topics to illustrate this approach of uh, flipped uh, teaching, tool training and evaluation. Digital collaboration, digital literacies, video in English language teaching, blended learning in English language teaching, uh, and dedicated language learning apps like Duolingo, for example, in ELT. Uh, so um, three elements. The first element then is the topic. The second element is uh, the flip, which is done pre-session. The students do this before they come to session and then uh, either online or on campus uh, in session. Um, OK, so the flip uh, in relation to uh, digital collaboration, I chose a piece of software called Mural, which illustrates collaborative mind mapping. And I always follow this stage. First of all, an example of, uh, of use. Uh, so. OK, so here's an example of use, something that I construct with um, this particular app which the students know what, what, therefore what it is and what they have to aim for. Then I give them a, a training uh, video on how to deal with this. Uh, so here you go, here's the training video. This is an introduction about how to use um, Mural for uh, collaborative mind mapping. So the first thing you need to do is go to the digital uh, team, the main team, this one. And okay, so um, that's that's the, the example of training. So I make that kind of training uh, stuff up. Uh, then um, the students themselves are uh, uh, actually in groups doing collaboration. They use the technology. So this is a, a team screenshot. And in the top here, you can see this is group A, and this is Mural Group A. So they access the software by clicking on this link and then they do their collaboration on it. Uh, and then in the end, they uh, produce their own product, okay? Here is the product. So we've got, uh, it's basically a hierarchical tree diagram of computer-assisted language learning, which they brainstorm themselves collaboratively. Okay, so that's the first example. The second example is uh, digital literacies in e ELT, uh, where I focused on one component of this multimedia literacy using uh, a freely available uh, avatar making software called Voki. So again, the same sort of process, uh, training. I want to introduce you to um, uh, a piece of software called Voki.com. Um, that's so, actually acting with your voice. So, again, the same approach whereby um, the uh, I, I I do the training video. Then the students, um, in their own time, this is typically an individual activity, actually practice using the technology themselves. Then the students uh, make their own product.
Hello, Hello, Xiao Han. How about your weekend? I went to a local Chinese supermarket yesterday. Are you happy to watch Fast and Furious 9 with me? Look forward to seeing you at Clive's class. A pretty weird uh, um, use of the product there, but any, we, we'll look at how that was picked up on later on. Okay, and then the next element was video in ELT as an example, using uh, interactive quizzes called Edpuzzle. Uh, so uh, again, here's an example of the training. If it takes too long, I'll just ditch it for now, but... Uh... Right, so that's uh, PowerPoint's not responding, so let me just remove that for a minute. Here we have uh, one of the joys of working with PowerPoint. Uh, so I'm going to have to go back to that again. OK. So I'll ditch that one, but basically it's the same approach, which is a, a training to the use of the software. Then uh, the students uh, make their own uh, product. Okay, so this is the product. Most educators are familiar with Bloom's taxonomy, a model that classifies different and his colleagues. So if we drag it up to the little bubbles at the bottom, then the students have learned that they can make questions, interactive questions. You can do something similar with Canvas, I think, but that's... Uh, that's the approach there. Um, blended, uh, blended learning then was the next stage. Again, an explanation of criteria. Uh, this was an assessed discussion group. So the students did an assessed discussion group, um, uh, explained the criteria to them. Um, they used the tech themselves. Actually, they had to have their assessed discussions. Um, and uh, and then they produced the product. Here's an example of the discussion group, um, which was assessed. OK, and then uh, dedicated language learning apps. The students focused on Quizlet. Uh, they were trained on how to use Quizlet. They produced their own examples of it. OK, so that was the way the flipping happened within the uh, within each of the sessions. And then um, of course, we, we have the online teaching and um, or, or, or the in-class teaching, which picked up on the processes in the flipped element. OK, and this basically followed this pattern. Um, uh, students share and do each other's practices, either in breakout rooms or in the classroom. So what they've done up here is brought to the classroom or the breakout room to share. We evaluate them. We reflect and evaluate the use, the process and the application to English language teaching. We link to various categories of computer assisted language learning and we link to theories of second language acquisition. That's it. That's the way it's uh, happened. OK, so I will uh, uh, stop talking there. OK, finished. <laughs> OK, so thank you, Clive. So shall I just pick up where Clive left off? Great. Let me just share my screen. OK, so hi, so my name is Chris Edmonds. I'm a lecturer in the Department of Physics. And I'm going to tell you a bit about how we use the collaborative platforms, teams in particular, to enhance our physics teaching. And hopefully give you an insight as to why Teams isn't just for COVID times and how it should last a little bit beyond, or a long way beyond. Okay, so one of the things that we aim to do whilst um, my slides progress, whilst teaching physics is, is nudge students from these points down here, so taking dreams like only where they kind of, these consumers of knowledge right up to here where they are creators of knowledge. Okay, and Teams and collaborative software is, is I feel, a really important part in, and it has a really part to, important part to play in this as we create these digital communities. So we'll look at how these communities, um, or why we created the communities, and why we think that we led to these behaviors, and also how it is that these uh, communities have helped. So we look at some of our famous physicists. We often think of them as working very independently. So Isaac Newton, Albert Einstein, both very, very famous 
Um, we always think of those individuals, but of course, they're very much a product of um, the society that they were in, the communities they were part of. Um, and they they fed off ideas of those around them. So collaboration, even then, was very important. We look at some of our contemporary examples. So uh, I don't know how famous um, this guy who is outside of it. it's Peter Hicks. Uh, he and uh, Francois Angela, they won the 2013 uh, Nobel Prize for Physics for their theoretical discovery of the his mechanism. So just describing why things around us have mass. Okay. And although they they proposed this Higgs boson in theory a very long time ago, it actually took tens of thousands of physicists to come together and work together collaboratively in order to build the large experiment that proved the existence of the particle that they theorized. Um, collaborations in terms of what they do, in terms of their size, they're grown. And we can see this. So in terms of the papers um, that are written, we see that teams are becoming larger across all sciences. And in fact, the most impactful papers are written by groups. Um, one of the reasons for this may be something called the burden of knowledge. So the more scientific uh, discovery takes place, the more it is somebody needs to know in order to discover something new. So you actually have to have these, these wide ranging teams in order to do something really effective. So communication and collaboration is fundamental to the most innovative science. And it's something that we should be um, imparting in our students too. So looking at an example of, of our teaching in physics, um, when we look at our physics projects, this is our final project, so some of which I'm the module coordinator. Um, this is completed in semester two of year three. And traditionally these uh, projects have been completed you know, using email exchanges, um, as well as weekly meetings that are face to face. And if you're an undergraduate student going into that kind of environment, then joining a face to face meeting with an academic who's very experienced can seem really quite intimidating. Okay. Um, and as a result, in that meeting, you're often quite inhibited and conversations don't flow. So it can be quite a passive experience. You can sit down, you can have a lot of information thrown at you, but you don't really feel particularly able to ask questions. And as part of this, uh, some students often complete projects as a scripted exercise. They don't really develop a sense of ownership of the project. And in order for someone to be creative with something, that sense of ownership is really important. So the real risk, and it's not something we think that happens a lot, but a student can complete something that's really quite technical, but not really understand what it is that they've done. So a solution from our perspective was to introduce a little bit more structure through these collaborative tools in order to give students hopefully much more ownership over the projects. So we built these digital communities um, with collaboration at heart. Um, and this has allowed us to do a number of things, including placing more emphasis on the process of completing a project itself. Um, we've been able to get involvement from the career service um, into our modules. Um, we have a much more active uh, project selection process, so students can really investigate what they're interested in. And also these um, digital communities that we've created, they've allowed us to focus much more on the, the students' engagement rather than, say, end goals like reports. So it offers a much more authentic experience in terms of the uh, assessment team. So one of the first decisions that we had to make with this kind of thing was, you know, what platforms we should be using. Um, Teams and Canvas, you know, there's a lot of pressure to use Canvas at the moment. Um, we don't feel as though it's either or. These things go very well uh, hand in hand. So if we look at Teams, so Teams is very much a communications and collaboration tool, a little bit of VLE um built in so we look at this a bit like a, a library space it's a place where people can interact a little bit more um and then we've got our vle which is canvas okay so that has a little bit of communications um built into it this is like the service desk it's the knowledge it's the, the fixed content for the module that's where people can check things in you know, such as assignments so there's strengths to using these and what i'll talk about in the next few slides is how we got that kind of balance and um what it is our, our teams look like. So this is the background of what we've done. On the next slides, um, I'll show you a little bit. Well, I'll give you an insight into what our students see when engaging with the module content that we've created. The BSc projects um, that I mentioned just before. So this is our team's layout for this. Um, this is for this year. Um, we have a general channel, um, which is the main channel where a lot of the module communication takes place. So there's the day-to-day -day communications. Often what would happen with these modules I should add, is we'd get the students started, we'd put them out there, they'd complete their projects. 
And we'd often not hear too much about from them as a module coordinator until towards the end of the project. For this here, we've also got these uh, private channels for the students, and this allows us to get really good insight into what the students are doing and just check that they're engaging with the projects and they're all doing okay. So this private channel, uh, this module here, we call it the portfolio of activity. It's where the students put in their um, project proposals. Um, a lot of their day-to-day -day communications, they use that as a log. Um, they arrange meetings with their supervisors in there. So we get a really great kind of idea as, as to what the students are doing. We use something called the class notebook, which is a feature through uh, OneNote. And I'm going to tell you a bit more about that in a moment. Um, uh, on, on top of this, we've got a careers channel, which you should be able to see somewhere hidden. Okay, and then the careers service have direct access to this. So students are allowed to hear um, or get some posts from the careers service about some, um, uh, say, seminars that might be relevant to their projects or maybe relevant to some of the um, decisions they're making about future careers choices, um, which again can inform what they or how they use that time working on the project. If they decide they need to develop a certain set of skills, and some of the information they get through careers might kind of guide that discovery. Uh, we've got a staff channel that's used for handling the day-to-day -day, um, kind of organization of the module as well. And then of course, uh, this, this little window here, we've got um, a tab at the top. This is the Canvas content for the module. So all the expectations for what the students should do, uh, the assignments, et cetera, and how to complete the assignments, that's all there. So that's our basic setup of Teams. Um, in terms of the feedback from the students of using that, we find that talking to past students, they find it's a much more authentic experience. Um, they feel better report, uh, prepared for the workplace. So speaking to the students who went into the workplace this last year in particular, they went from using Teams in that project straight into using Teams in the workplace. And some of them didn't actually visit the workplace for several months due to COVID. Um, we have this much better evidence of student process. So we get this really good insight into how a student goes about tackling the project, which before we didn't have such a good insight. Um, and we're seeing a, you know, a good body of discussion between students and supervisors too, and often larger project teams. So one of the nice outcomes from this is when it used to be a one-to-one -one relationship between a student and a supervisor, we're seeing um, much, kind of, we're getting a much better idea of the kind of supervisory teams that are there for students. And there's a little bit of feedback from a student um, from just this last year, so you can communicate very easily. I think a big advantage to this approach is it feels a bit more informal. So it's a nice way to reduce the barrier to ask questions. So again, it's we've seen this evidence that the students um, feel more kind of enabled to answer or ask questions um, of their supervisors in this kind of platform. We get good insight into the kind of um, relationship they develop. And then finally, the last thing I'll add on this authenticity thing, in terms of the log, log books are absolutely fantastic. We asked them to complete a log for the projects. The students were very used to completing paper-based logs in the past. Um, I love paper-based logs, I have my own, I keep them all the time. But in terms of asking them to do something that's assessed, I think this kind of log is, is much more relevant in terms of the way in which they're working in physics. So the students are producing a lot of code. Previously, they were staping that code into the logbook. Now they you know, set up things like GitHub and Agon tabs in, um, in their team channel. Okay, so second quick example, so Viz206. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about this because it's a bit different in terms of what we offer. It's got some of the same features. We've got these private channels down here that groups use. Um, we've got a general channel for the module matters. When the groups organize meetings, you see little cameras appear here so you can see which groups are active during the lab session. Um, for some of this stuff, we've got six weeks uh, scripted exercises and we've used this thing called uh, OneNote. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this, but it's a feature of Teams. So every time you set up a uh, class team, um, you'll get this OneNote set up as well, so you can actually create worksheets and distribute these to all the students. Um, so that's what this looks like here. I've just blocked out the names of the students down here, but you create the worksheet once, you add all the images, you can add software, you can add lots of different resources. Um, there's a little button you press at the top, you distribute it to all the students, um, and you can actually go through all of these and then see the students actually progressing through these worksheets, which is really helpful. So on this next slide here, we've got student entry, um, it just shows you the progress that a student is making. Um, so you can just check to see how it is that you're doing. Uh, you can provide them feedback if you have any questions. They can write on that at the end. And if I have time, I think Monica, do I have one minute left or so? Yes, you do. I do, one okay. Minute. Brilliant, okay. So what I'll do is I'll just show you a quick video. Hopefully I click to share a sound, um, but tell me if it's not playing. I might have to... So I was introduced to Teams uh, in labs at uni and we were using it to sort of 
coordinate the different exercises we do each week. So there was a small group project where it was, we needed a platform for us to be able to share information, be able to share documents, and be able to communicate on the same platform and to be able to have um, conversations with staff as well as our peers within that process. At first we couldn't really understand why we were using it as opposed to just like the usual way that we receive our files and everything and then sort of as the more we use it it became quite clear that because we could then communicate with our lecturers and each other and it would update like automatically and it just worked so much better. With teams we use it a lot for sharing files with each other, sharing what we're thinking so if we've got any questions we can put in that we'll have module coordinators in there and other students so there's always a way of communicating with someone who can probably help you. So we're really seeing the value of this kind of tool within our project-based learning. So the students are able to really have this really good flow of dialogue with their supervisors and their teammates, and they're able to share information really very readily, as well as doing the more structured aspects of the course too. It's really useful to separate sort of my uni life from my social life because especially when we're working in projects with people that we wouldn't usually work with it's really nice to not have to record all their sort of details we can just have it in one place ready to go so it allows you to have access to all the different information collate all the stuff you need to and be able to have that communication through staff and students okay so that's that's a kind of our student mistake that's why i just realized i forgot to switch my own camera on at the beginning of this um, so an added thing that the students really appreciate is the fact that we don't have to use Facebook, etc. when they are engaging in group projects. So there's a, some real option, a very real benefit for the students who choose to use this. Um, oh. So I was introduced. Sorry. And then the last thing to mention, I think if you are using it as a collaborative um, type environment, uh, there is a massive divide in the kind of resources that the students have available to, to them. Um, that is a challenge with using these teams-based environments when you try to do the more advanced stuff. Um, some students have, you know, a fairly working mobile phone with a correct screen, whilst others have iPads or surfaces with styluses to input into these things. Anyway, that was a very brief overview of how we've used some of these technologies in, in physics. And I think now on to Rob. Well, thanks, Chris. Um, Okay, so um, let me just share my screen with you. I'll introduce myself in a second as well. Um, Windows, I want to share my screen. Okay, so I'm going to make you, there you go, right there. So, page up. Right, can everyone see my title slide there? Yep. Yes, thanks, Chris. Okay, um, my name is Bob Pihar. Um I, 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 am a, I am a physicist, actually. It's always very difficult to come after Chris because it makes me very nostalgic <laughs> for, for um, sort, of, sort of my past. Uh, like I see those students, they were writing uh, equations that I recognised there as well. But I'm actually uh, based in life sciences now. Um, and uh, my, well, one of my primary roles um, as a lecturer in life sciences is to teach all of our first year undergraduates, uh, for which there are about 420 typically, um, their maths and their statistics. And also we now teach uh, coding um, at, uh, from a, at a, an introductory to coding for a, from a first year, for a first year um, course as well. Um, so before I give you a bit more of the context and how I use Teams to do that and how I've used Monica's champions model um, in my teaching, I think I'd like to, to jump in my, my time machine a second and go back to 2018. And I, I kind of simplified things a bit here, but really this is kind of, this, this was it. This is my teaching, right? I'd, I'd rock up to a lecture or um, uh, a workshop. All the resources would be on Blackboards, which of course is our outgoing uh, VLE. All of our communication would have been via email, typically. That's not, that's not entirely true. We were um, with, we were testing out Slack, I remember, at the time. Um, and any any document that I was sharing, I would have actually used Google Docs. I still use Google. I loved Google Docs. Um, but now I'm more on board with the kind of the Office 365 um, stuff that the university has access to. So that was like two years ago, um, pre, pre-pandemic, pre-paradigm shift. Um, pre-online teaching. This is what things look like today. Um, and I've tried to, it's a, it's a bit of a shoddy diagram, but you can see Blackboard is just edging out, out of the screen there. That's getting turned off at the end of 
this month. Um, Teams is kind of the kernel which I hang all of these technologies off now. So really what I'm teaching, I'm, I'm you know, for like 99% of what I'm doing, I'm using Teams as the sort of the linchpin application for which I'm linking out to. That includes going to places like Canvas, you know, which is our, our static VLE, um, which is replacing Blackboard. Um, but, you know, in, in and amongst all of that, we're now using things like, well, I'm using Zoom um, very or sort of seldomly instead of Teams because I'm not sure. I think this is changing, actually, but um, we could we had more students that could fit into a Teams meeting. So we still use a bit of Zoom. I would rather use Teams. Um, and then we're sort of link. We're using that as the, the the sort of control panel to go into a canvas, access any resources. Um, I'm using things like YouTube, Office 365 for sharing documents, still using Google Sheets occasionally when Office 365 lets me down. And um, we're teaching code now as well. So we're using things like R Studio. And um, there's a lot of a lot of video content. So things like this is the the gray logo there is for um, Canvas Studio, a lot of video hosts on there and on YouTube. OK, so that's kind of this is my, my teaching world now compared to two years ago. So it's, it's somewhat more complex, but it's it it really has triggered quite a sizable shift in the level of student engagement that we're getting uh, and i attribute most of that to the adoption of microsoft teams as a kind of um a, a community of practice really um which it's somewhere where students can go not just to interact directly with me, but with each other and the rest of the team. And you know, they ask questions based on the content, but also pastoral questions. And um, and, and it's used, you know, extensively. Right? And, you know, I, I, I did try and do an audit of how many messages I'd received on Teams compared to how many emails I had received from students prior to Teams. And it was like a factor of 10 higher. OK, so it's really something as enabling students or breaking down that barrier between the students and myself, students and the demonstrators, and you know, students who probably may not have had the courage to ask a question previously are now doing so, okay, and benefiting from that. So it's a huge positive impact uh, in a very, very difficult time. Okay, that's that's the best way I can put it, I think. So a bit more top context. Um, so I'm teaching a course called Life 113. Um, the first half of that is your sort of nuts and bolts um, introductory algebra and probability and statistics. Um, and then the second half of it, sort of December onwards, is a crash course in R coding. OK, um, 420 students. We've got 25 PGR demonstrators and we really do structure that team um, well. Um, we've got a couple of lead demonstrators who really do sort of whip the rest of the team members into shape and sort of encourage engagement there. Um, we've had, we really do focus less these days on our lectures for delivering content. And it's almost exclusively now online active learning on Teams, okay? And a lot of that is supported by, I've called it bite-sized asynchronous content. So they are little little snippets of videos that I've created. Some of the team members have created, uh, create, cremated, created, um, which are probably no longer than sort of five to ten minutes long. Keep them short, right? Um, okay, so that's the end of my presentation. But I'm now going to skip in. I want to show you what this looks like. I'm going to go to my team. So this is our this is our Life Woman Three. It's a bit dusty at the moment. We have it's only a first semester module, so I haven't used it since. Um, the end of January, I don't think. So I saw Chris earlier had it structured for each student. Um, I don't think we can do that because we've got so many. I, don't, I think there's only a, I think there's a limited number of private channels you can have in Teams. So what we did is we divided our students up into um, these workshop groups. We gave them um, animal names so they could identify with those. So they could say they were a crocodile or jaguar. Um, and additional to that, we had our, our general sort of thing general channel here where we would just post questions outside of any timetabled um, sessions. So the important thing is here, we, we really were careful to say, right, we're only going to interact with this during the timetable sessions you have within the workshops. Anything else is going to be in the other channels here. And, and that, that was actually quite important because otherwise students would ask questions and then 
those questions would get missed outside of those times. So we, we were quite strict about that. Um, within the workshop, let's just, let's just pick on a workshop here. Um, within the workshop, um, we put two demonstrators in each one. Um, so they were responsible for really answering any questions um, the students might have in real time and also giving them vital information. You know, this is so I think this is the last post in this um, this channel here by the amazing sample saying it was the last tutorial um, was happening. Um, and we had, I mean, if I just I'm gonna zip through this, I mean, the the way students interacted with this was just phenomenal. I'd never experienced anything like it, just posting. And once they once they sort of dipped their toe in, <laughs> they really were they they you know they were really adept at posting screenshots and um, being very very descriptive about what their issue was. Very very sort of technical, very nuts and bolts um, related to the content. And I'm not sure where it is. It's probably somewhere in it's like December sometime with the coding where this magical moment happened where we kind of reached a point where students began answering their own questions <laughs> which of course made all of, all of the rest of our demonstrated team redundant not entirely but um very more often than not a another student would jump in and answer a question um in sufficient detail that the the, the other student who'd asked it asked the question actually understood what was going on uh, and you know that and what what typically happened for every one sort of sort of start a sort of kernel of a question that a student posted usually led to a discussion you know typically um with sort of five plus responses to it okay so a combination of um demonstrators and their peers as well so that was sort of the real sort of peer aspect to this um and uh, let me let me just let me show you what we why I, I i kept an eye on so in Teams is a great tool. I can find it now. Ah, I was Googling stuff earlier. Hang on. Here we go. So um, you can add this Insights app to any team um, in Microsoft Teams. So I'm able to keep track of the activity in each of those channels. So this is this is kind of my timeline um, over one, two, three. I think that's pretty much three workshops. We had a big break uh, before Christmas Day. Um, so there were there were 200 posts. Um, and by posts, I mean questions instigated by students. And for those 200 posts, there were one, almost one and a half thousand replies. OK, so so that is, you know, that includes everything from my demonstrator posting a direct answer to a conversation between um, demonstrators, myself and the teams. Um, what this doesn't include is for any instance where, you know, we had a large number of replies to post, and it was kind of clear that there wasn't something wasn't quite right here. That would be the moment where me or one of the other academic members of the team would jump in, start a video in Teams, start a, a meeting, and we would just all sort of bundle in and we would record the meeting and we would sort of discuss it in person. So it was this, this flip flop between sort of text chats and video um, that was really sort of incredibly powerful within Teams. I mean, you couldn't you could not do this in a in a lecture environment, and you'd struggle to do it in a, a sort of an, an active learning space as well. Um, with with that speed, you know, you'd have to at least flag someone down or wait till the demonstrator was free to come over and talk to you. Um, so in terms of the engagement for online compared to the olden days when we did it in person, just an order of magnitudes higher. Um, so that's that's all I really wanted to talk to you about uh, and show you. Um, and uh, yeah, I think I'll stop there for brevity. I'm not sure how long, how long I talk for then. Is that OK, everybody? 10 minutes. Yeah. Thank you, Joanna. <laughs> So fascinating stuff. Um, I'm, I'm echoing. Do I echo to everyone else? Yes. What Stand I'd like. Um, why am I echoing? Monica, can I ask you to um, host questions um, yes, for of course. your team? Thank you. Yes, so we, 
we have a couple of minutes only, so are there any questions? Um, maybe we can answer one or two, and the rest of you could put them in the chat. I'm sure uh, we'll be able to answer them. I've got one. Yeah, Carola <laughs> and then Anne. Hi. Yes, yeah. go on. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think it's interesting, isn't it, how actually COVID and the pandemic probably sped up your development of, of communities of practice that otherwise might have uh, trundled on. I suppose what I'm wondering is as we're sort of looking towards going back to face-to-face -to -face classes, ultimately, how do you feel that your uh, teaching, uh, Rob, maybe, or uh, Chris, how, how, will you continue to use Teams as a platform when you're back face-to-face? -face? So I've, I've had quite a couple of lively debates um, with my own colleagues, including my head of department, about this, and I am I am determined. I'm, I'm, I love I, I do miss the face to face teaching. I do I will look forward to going back and sort of giving my sort of traditional lectures. But in terms of um, workshops for large classes, um, I am determined to keep them online, um, and that's for two reasons. One, and I can I can you know this is these are the arguments I'm giving to my own head of department. One engagement is, is incredibly high compared to um, a sort of a room full of students and also two logistically both previously and now with any ex sort of you know sort of existing social uh, distancing restrictions to book rooms for 400 students in one go is all well it's is impossible we've never really been able to do it and you know, we've always had to I, I remember before I used to have about five separate rooms running concurrently and I'd have a demonstrator team manning. I'd be running around like a blue ass fly between all of those rooms, checking, you know, they hadn't, hadn't burnt the place down or something like that. So now I can stay in, I can I can put a shirt on, but my pajama bottoms are on. And then I can just do what I've got to do. And the engagement is going to be higher. And I, I'm really able to sort of interact with my students more. I think it will still be important that on at a sort of an individual level. Uh, maybe we, we did have tutorials as well, which were sort of much lower numbers. I'm going to try and keep as many face to face of those as possible, because the one thing I really miss personally is actually meeting students. Uh, I've got a whole class of students who I know online. Some of them have never put their cameras on before. I've never seen their faces or heard their voices. And that's that's still quite sad for me. I, I, I miss that a lot. So I will look forward to going back to do that. Um, there's no way I'm going back to those massive physical spaces and go, I'm going to do it on Teams, yeah. So I think, I guess physics is a little bit different. We have much smaller cohorts than with Rob. So we don't have any of the kind of 400 large, uh, you know, classes. We do have classes up to around 80 or 90 um, for say labs, for example. And we did have labs where um, the students were using Teams, you know, they're using the collaborative tools within Teams within that lab setting. And that's something we'll very much continue to do. Um, so the use of, say, OneNote for distributing some of the, the worksheets that students complete, um, and just just for kind of helping them build a kind of community within that lab setting that they can then take out of the lab, that's incredibly beneficial. So, yes, we'll continue to use Teams. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Joanna, do we have time for Anne's question? Yes, we do, actually, because okay. um, breaks doesn't have to start till 11 so we've got okay. a bit of flexibility in this Excellent. session so Anne it'd be lovely to oh, hear from you. Oh thank you it's only a very quick question um, I, I've had um, a bit of an IT nightmare this morning and was late joining the session um, is it being recorded and will I be able to access it somewhere so I can catch up on what I've missed? Uh, yes kind of Monica you're recording at, as we speak as you can see at the top there kind of Anne so I okay. believe that it will and the recording will reside within the team um, that you're in at the moment um, to be part of this session so the conference team but I think Robin and Becky will sort that out okay. so that's good. Thanks. So does anybody else have questions? I mean I was um I love kind of what you guys have been doing. I have to say from the core kind of community of practice of the champions through to the communities of practice that you guys are creating with students. So we genuinely have 
um, the divisions between lecturers and students kind of eroding to make students um, kind of part of the production of knowledge. I'm finding that in all of yours. Um, one thing um, that I find uh, is true across much um, online learning, but I think is particularly true kind of at these times is the structure. So Clive, you mapped out yours. Um, you both, you, all three of you who were talking about your practice um, were showing kind of structural concerns. Do you have one tip about how to approach structure and why teams might really help you do that? Um, can I ask each of you? So Rob, Clive, Chris? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it relates to the principles and practice of, of, of flipped teaching, really, uh, where, whereby um, a lot of uh, a lot of the tr traditional uh, knowledge input uh, can actually be provided uh, by collaborative tasks or by pre-recorded videos or by external sourced videos, which the students actually have tasks based around and, and then you use the actual face-to-face -face or online, depending on uh, wh where you actually have the, um, the synchronous interaction with the students. Um, and, and that is used for exploring the, the input which has been provided outside the class. That, that's uh, how I see the structure, yeah. Anybody else, Chris, Rob, or Monica? Kind of, you know, how did you structure the whole community of practice in the first place? I think Chris wants to go first, so and then okay. Rob. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> I was volunteering yet, so, go on. <laughs> so I think one of the things that's important with the structure with this kind of team stuff is it, it might not always be exactly what you wanted. Um, so when you, you there's a lot of limitations with the software. <laughs> in that regard you know so it does take some exploration to see what's possible before you actually come up with the structure that you will use i think there are other things that you'd really love to do and then there's the reality of what we're able to do i think rob mentioned before you know there's a limitation on the number of private channels so the structure that we've adopted for first 379 for project modules it's not going to be appropriate for everybody you know we can just get away with it because there's 60 students up to who take this module you know so we have one main channel or one main team and then an overflow team as well I wouldn't like to do that with any more students to rest. Um, and that, that's a frustration rather than a, kind of a, a tip. So I would say it does take that kind of that exploration of what is available before you actually come up with a structure that's going to work best for you. My, if I can jump in on the end there, Chris, my, my advice for anyone who's, who's structuring a, a team space for their students is to strongly resist the temptation um, to silo any groups of students. Uh, it's, it, you know, as tell officer in the school as well, one of the biggest requests I get is can you add all of these students to teams and then can you put them into groups where they can't see or talk to each other, um, just limited groups? And that for me defeats the purpose of teams. Um, I would insist that every channel was accessible to every student, with the exception of anything that maybe was, was pastoral or something that you know was private in terms of organisation. So between me and my demonstrators, for example. Um, but if there's an interesting question in any one of those channels, then that is useful information to any student in another, another channel. OK, and they should be free to, to hop and jump between the two. And that, that often happens. Someone would say, oh, we've got a discussion going in Crocodile channel right now. Um, you can come in and, and, and join it. So. I would really resist sort of the the old mentality of sort of dividing and conquering your students. You don't need to do that anymore. Okay, you don't need to book physical spaces. You can only fit ten people in and book a dozen of them. You can have them all at the same time. That's a, a huge benefit to everybody. Um, yeah, that's my that's my advice. The only the only caveat to that I'd say is if you have got. Um, different students in separate channels working on different tasks which at some other stage in the structure the results of those tasks are going to be shared in some kind of jigsaw process then you need the initial separation in order to create the so-called information gap for the actual sharing of information say in a real physical uh, classroom so in some cases uh, you want the separation in order to facilitate subsequent 
real communication of what would be new ideas for the for the other people who haven't been researching a particular area. That's the only thing I'd, I'd add to that. And one problem with teams actually at the moment is you can't uh, you can't pre-organize breakout groups. Uh, they 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 have to be done live, which is a real pain if you then have to put different students specifically into different groups because you know they haven't covered certain topics and you want them to interact in the way I've described. So that's um, yeah. Right. Well, we're pushing, we're pushing the tech, the edge, aren't you, Clive? Well, yeah, I've, I've, I've raised this with Microsoft. Yeah. <laughs> so, Monica, you're just typing there at the moment. Yeah, I just wanted to say um, <clears throat> that I would recommend getting clear on the pedagogical principles behind what, whatever that you, you're trying to do. Yeah. For example, for online communities, you have several frameworks, but of course, I'm more acquainted with communities of practice. You have the community of inquiry as well. Um, and for communities of practice, the principles there are seven principles that you should follow. And one of them that I really love and I think we often forget is to design for evolution. Things will not remain the same uh, in, in that online space and you need to think ahead and adapt a lot. And a second principle would be to create private spaces as, as well as the communal spaces, which I think, uh, for example, Rob has done that and all the champions have done in, in their own practice. Um, it's important to, to give that private space because not everybody feels, I, I, I talk from the perspective of working with academics. Sometimes it's so difficult to ask a question when your colleagues are there, your peers, because you have this level of authority and, and reputation that you want to save face, for example. And that's why creating a private space for learners is so important. I think that private space is important for our projects as well. So um, one of the things that we were looking to address is the student's confidence in asking questions to a supervisor. And, you know, we, we set up this general channel and we hope that all the students is putting like lots of new fish into a fish tank. You hope everyone's going to enjoy the little bridges and little bubble things. You know? <laughs> and at first they ignore everything. And they just send you an email instead and they don't want to ask in that more public setting. So it's definitely a case of building confidence as the students use these different facilities. And having a private space is helpful with that, or semi-private. Yeah, that's great. I love the way that you all are thinking pedagogically about what you want to achieve. Um, and I like the way that kind of um, you're taking into account the way in which people do interact with each other, initially potentially a bit shy, and then as kind of the community builds, kind of um, creating more kind of um, space to kind of, you know, actually kind of really kind of interact and, and students suddenly ask questions, start asking questions. And was it Chris who, was it Chris who mentioned the moment when the students started answering the questions? That was wonderful, I love that. Um, I think, yes, kind of, I think kind of um, we need to close up now. And thank you very much for your um, goodbye message there. Um, and um, I really want to thank our presenters, um, not just for this session, but for the inspiration they've provided over the last you know, year and a half um, in various kind of fora. Um, any kind of further questions, pop them in the chat and maybe you guys could have a little look to see if there are any a bit later. Um, it's wonderful work anyway and very inspiring. So thank you so much for your session. Um, off for a nice break now and I'll see some of you later. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.